Uh, welcome everyone to another uh, College of Music and Fine Arts, Music Industry Studies Forum. Uh, I hope you like the film, it's uh, really wonderful. The Coen brothers are pretty amazing. Uh, and uh, we've got one of the stars of the film with us tonight, really, really lucky, Mr. John Goodman. Um, John is like an amazingly successful actor, uh, and he's actually quite beloved. All the wild and strange ro uh, roles that I've uh, seen him in, people always say what a great dude he seems, and actually he is. Uh, he's a great uh, adopted son here to New Orleans, and oh, I have a great, I have a great quote that I have to do. Uh, the Cohen brothers, Ethan Cohen, uh, when uh, he got asked uh, why he kept casting uh, John uh, in movies, said he's normal but crazy, uh, like every like everyone else, only more vividly. That's it, John Goodman. Got it. Oh. Uh, comfortable. Well, one of the reasons that we're really happy to have you here. Are you, did you make it? <laughs> I'm a scared. <laughs> Oh, my voice isn't going to work. <laughs> It'll be fine. Dude. All right. Uh, is Talk that we've like got <laughs> we've got so and many young people yet. here, uh, <laughs> and all of them are at the start of their careers and are really excited about finding a life in the arts, finding a way to get there. And the, one of the big things we've been doing are trying to find people who started out at a young age and got up to being these giant successes. And I know you started even in high school drama, right? I was never young. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I, uh, I started in junior high school. I uh, did a production of You Can't Take It With You. And I forgot my lines in the middle of a monologue, so I got up from my chair and walked around the table about three times making things up until I found where I was supposed to be. Then I planted my hiney back down in the seat and finished the scene. And I had a very uh, buxom uh, acting teacher, director, who gave me a big hug. And I, said, I want more of this. <laughs> uh, and I, I did a couple of musicals in high school you know, that's where the girls were, so. <laughs> and, yeah, it was like on a dare uh, to, to go to this audition with a buddy of mine, and uh, I liked it. And then, uh, but then you went on uh, to uh, Missouri Southern. I, w I went to uh, junior college for a year, uh, um, wasted a semester, and then the sec second semester did three plays. I went to what is now uh, Missouri State University there. in Springfield. It was Southwest Missouri State College at the time. <laughs> then it got airs. It started putting on airs. And um, wasted a semester in a fraternity. I wanted to walk on the football team. And my football team won one game in four years. We won that game six to nothing. So they weren't beating down my door. But anyway, I tried to walk on a football team. That didn't work out. I didn't have the grades. Um, and in the spring semester, I, I did a one act that uh, who eventually became my acting teacher and mentor came to see and um, started casting me in things the next fall. And I, I didn't know that I had in me what I found. I just didn't know I had that passion. Um, but it unlocked something, and it, 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 I just couldn't get enough of it. I, uh, I actually started studying um, and paying attention to things. Uh, really deeply passionate about reading um, the history of whatever I was doing, just um, it, it really sparked something in me. And uh, and I had a very happy four years there. We had a, 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 a great faculty and um, more importantly, a great drama department. The people in it were equally as passionate um, and incestuous. <laughs> 
Which is important when you're that age. <laughs> But it, 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 was, it was a wonderful environment. <laughs> I had a couple of friends that had, had moved to New York, graduated um, before me and moved up there. So I knew they didn't die yet, so I knew it was safe. And I uh, took a train to New York in 1975 from St. Louis. I really didn't have any expectations other than I had to go, or I'd kick myself in the ass for the rest of my life. I, I just had to go. Um, and even if I didn't make it, I, I, I knew I'd be involved in the theater one way or the other, you know, like doing community theater. Um, I, I just had to be involved. So you and I got, I got a, a dinner theater job out of town the first month I was there, so. <laughs> because I couldn't get, nobody'd hire me as a waiter. Or a bartender, which is probably a real good thing, the way things turned out. <laughs> uh, but yeah, not good. So you're there 23 years old and you're in New York City trying to survive and yet trying to find work. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, I, I went up there to, to go to school. Um, the ultimate goal was to get, try to get into the actor's studio. Ah. Um, but I went to a place called HB Studios uh, which was Uta Hagen's school at the time. And it, it just didn't work out. Um, I didn't give it enough time, but the classes I took were like taking a step backwards. Uh, I'm not disparaging the school, it's a great school, but it didn't work for me. But you started getting some sort of roles and you... Uh, uh, yes, heard... that's how you describe some sort. Some... <laughs> And, uh, and commercials, I understand you bit a Whopper. It was one of your first time on TV. Was that on TV? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I uh, got really lucky. Within two years, I, I started doing commercials. And at the time, <laughs> uh, I, I really hated it. I sold out. I, uh, um, wiping my feet on my art. I was this, I was that, but I, but I, I sure cashed the checks. <laughs> and it, you know, looking back, it, it, it's just stupid because I was getting work and I was learning at the same time. But I had a lot of friends that were doing um, films and, and were getting good roles in, in the theater in New York. And uh, I, I just had problems with, with me doing commercials. It's just really stupid and arrogant. You know, one of the things that I didn't know about you and until I found this first big break was that you sang. You, uh, and your really big first Broadway break, you got in uh, Big River and actually won awards as a, a singer in a musical. Yeah, I don't know if I won any awards, but uh, oh, yeah. yeah, that started <laughs> off in, um, at the La Jolla Playhouse uh, the year before. And they brought me, they brought me in with the production. Sorry about my voice, guys. Yeah, and so uh, that lasted two years and really hit on top of what was going to become kind of a pivotal couple of years in your life. You were in uh, David Burns' uh, uh, True Stories. True Stories, which I love. Yeah, I, I left. Uh, I left Big River to do True Stories, and then while I was shooting True Stories, I auditioned for a movie called The Big Easy which was shot here. <clears throat> and, and right after that, uh, I auditioned for Joel and Ethan Cohen uh, for Raising Arizona. Huge, uh, huge year in your life, 87. Yeah. And that was when, of course, uh, one of the, the Big Easy uh, piece, was that when you met your wife? Wasn't it about the same No, year? that was uh, in eight, that was in 87. It was a couple of years after this. Uh, uh, and in Baton Rouge, we shot a film called Everybody's All American. Right, it was a football Hackford. movie at uh, Taylor Hackford directed in, in um, at LSU, and that's where you met. Uh, I, I, yeah, we came down uh, for a Halloween party at Tipitina's, and this beautiful girl walked up to me and said hi, and I, I went, hi. <laughs> "Why is she talking to me?" So I, I, you know, I thought she was goofing on me. And uh, so she immediately thought I was a jerk, but I, I kept tabs on her and started dating her about a year later. Wow. And that's right on the, right on the beginning of the big kahuna, Roseanne. 
Is that what you call her? I. <laughs> Uh, the big kuna. Yeah, she lives in Hawaii now, so she is the big kuna. And that, and that was 221 episodes and nine years of your life. Wow. How, what? <laughs> and I'm still here. <laughs> what was it like to do something like that for nine years? It was uh, too long. Yeah, they, I mean, they got into really goofy storylines toward the end. Uh, I, I think usually after about five years, the sitcom has run its course, uh, you know. But again, I wasn't turning down the dough. But I, I, I was getting personally itchy. Uh, and it, it's, I, I was lucky enough to do, usually cram in a couple of films during the summer break uh, during it. But yeah, I, I got, I was I was ready to go after about five or six years. Wow! But there were some uh, pretty interesting uh, summer films during this time. One of them called Arachnophobia. Uh, <laughs> another one called Babe, uh, and The Flintstones. <laughs> Those. <laughs> Sorry, if, if you've heard Yabba Dabba Do as many times as I had, you'd, you'd have a nervous twitch too. <laughs> Uh, and the whole time you it's were... It's either that or shut the fuck up, Donnie. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Well, uh... <laughs> All the while you're doing this... Inc uh, you're doing The Factory of Roseanne and you're doing uh, these the other films, you were appearing uh, on talk shows and on Saturday Night Live 14 times. And one time, in this particular role, as Miss Tripp. Oh, God. Seven times. <laughs> hey, that's not bad. <laughs> in case you uh, didn't know, during the uh, Bill Clinton, Monica Lewinsky uh, uh, scandal and the like, uh, uh, Saturday Night Live broke before anybody else the fact that Linda Tripp was, this woman was uh, recording all the conversations with Monica Lewinsky and providing evidence that Bill Clinton had indeed had sex with that woman. And somehow, how did you get talked into Define doing sex. this? Define sex. <laughs> oh, it, uh, she bore a striking resemblance to me at the time. <laughs> oh, wait now, this, this is the odd and part. And I, I wanted to stop doing it after a while because it was, it was like beating a dead horse after a while. <laughs> It was so easy. <laughs> Do you know that in a story in U.S. News and World Report in like 1998, she actually cited your, uh, in, uh, your impersonation of her as being one of the principal reasons she got plastic surgery? <laughs> Which is an odd twist because I got a sex change about that time. <laughs> I, I think that she was a little worried. That I like those dresses she wore. <laughs> and the shoes were comfortable. <laughs> oh my, and you were, uh, you were the very first guest ever on Conan O'Brien. Conan O'Brien, yeah. In 1993. Yeah, they gave me a medal. <laughs> <laughs> it was supposed to be somebody else. They dropped out, so I, I got it. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's, odd. it's an odd <coughs> thing about it, what you were telling me while we were backstage. Uh, uh, John's on Letterman tomorrow night, and they do a, a pre-interview interview? Yeah, and they want cute stories, and I don't have any. I, 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 uh, it got me so nervous that I, I, I threw up. I just couldn't think of anything, so I don't know what I'm going to talk about, but uh, David Letterman's pretty good at bringing things out. I saw oh, you man. talking to him about Argo, and, and you just had him by the collar. You just had him under your thumb. Oh, let's hope, hope for that magic twice. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, 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 they all want cute stories about Joel and Ethan. And they're funny guys, but they're, they're, there's no zany antics on the set. They're, uh, they're pretty businesslike. Unless I try to make Ethan laugh, which... Is, I'll, I'll try to do one or two takes, just do something goofy to hear him go. <laughs> so you mentioned that you auditioned with him the first time in 87 for Raising 85. Arizona. 85. 85. <laughs> yeah. Uh, How was it like? I it mean, was the best audition I ever had. 
and I didn't even know if I was going to get the job, but I'd never had so much fun in an audition. Um, I walked in and, and started, this is going to sound bad, but I, I started goofing on the other resume pictures uh, that were spread out of the other actors, uh, <laughs> one of which was uh, Jesse the Body Ventura, who was up for um, uh, Randall, uh, anyway, one of the roles. And I just started doing professional wrestling bits, and, and we all started laughing. And I was in there for about an hour, and we just goofed around the whole time. And it was, you know, it was like running into uh, fellow Midwestern wise guys, kids that got in trouble in school, read a lot of Mad Magazine. It just, I just felt right at home. Uh, and I was pleased. Uh, a year and a half ago when I got an email from Ethan saying, hey, Madman, we got something you might be interested in. Uh, another gas bag. <laughs> you I, I, I specialize in, in gas bags for them. Uh, the other gig gas bag and very uh, strange homicidal gas bag was, was in Barton Fink. How did you get him so scary? I mean, you're such a nice guy. He was a scary character. Yeah, but he was a nice guy. <laughs> Oh, uh, just misunderstood. <clears throat> he, yeah, he's uh, scary because he's such a normal, normal Joe. And um, you just hear things about him that could be true, but, it, but he, he maintains his niceness until the end when he says Zig Heil and blows some guy away with a shotgun. And then you went from the guy with the shotgun to, I think, probably your most famous role in The Big Lebowski. I mean, the movie. Ow! Ow! <laughs> and the, the, the Coens wrote that, that, uh, that part for you. Yeah, uh, they had uh, yeah, Turturro and, and me and, and Buscemi in mind. Um, And it was great because we had two weeks of rehearsal before we started shooting, which is it's unusual these days. But we got the, the dialogue was so intricate um, and, and so, so rapid fire that we got a chance to smooth all of that out to the point where a lot of people think it was improvised. But their, their stuff is so good and so careful and sounds so true that uh, it sounds improvised. They're just they're great writers. And uh, the weird part was, I, um, I understood that you lived in the dude world during the picture, and then uh, the next time you saw Bridges, you could barely even recognize. No, it, it was, uh, <clears throat> yeah, we were all hanging out, you know, doing the film. Uh, about nine months later, we had to do a photo shoot for GQ or Esquire or Vogue or something like that. It wasn't Vogue. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, Jeff shows up and it was a totally different guy. I just, it, it's a, he was a total stranger, you know. Um, did he live the dude during the shoot? Or did you I, see I didn't go home with him. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, I don't know. He didn't smoke anything on the set, but uh, I don't know how much he got into it. But it it was just like a total different human being. That's I, it, it was really uncomfortable. <laughs> hey, man. Uh, hi, John. How are you? After <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, I don't think that I know of any other film that has that has such a loyal following. This, this, this far along, or this many years later, people that just adore that film and have to see it over and over again. Scary. It is scary. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's not, it's not culty Scientology culty. It's, it's culty good, clean, fun culty. Uh, I'm a fan of the film, so I, I, I appreciate uh, the cultiness of it. My, uh, my neighbor has a white Russian party once a year, <laughs> just on purpose. Caucasians. <laughs> <laughs> and so went from that totally outrageous movie and went as far as you could away from it and became oh brother where art thou um, yeah up in Canton Mississippi 
we used to wonder because we had the, the Ku Klux Klan rally in these huge weird formations of marching around and we'd see planes flying overhead every once in a while, small aircraft, and we'd go, what in God's name could they be thinking up there? <laughs> <laughs> Looking down on all this stuff. It just, was this, uh, I know we, I had asked you before, I thought this, this might have been the first time you worked with George Clooney, but you had a really long-term relationship. You knew him in? George was on the first year of Roseanne. Wow. He played Roseanne's boss, had a quasi-love affair with Jackie, uh, the great Laurie Metcalf. Not in real life, but... Uh, and uh, George was a marginal character on the show. He kind of thought, he knew his character wasn't going to go anywhere. So he thought it'd be smart to leave a number one show. Well, he could before he was asked off or just written out. Uh, and I always thought that was really smart. And then I heard he went to some soap opera or something. <laughs> so he went to medical school for seven years and, and then he did ER. But George is always smart like that. He's a good actor, very practical, uh, has a great heart. And it turns out uh, he's a wonderful director, one of the best I've ever worked for. Well, we're going to talk about that some more. In just, in okay, just, I, I, I think that I, <laughs> I want to get sorry. you on that. So then, then you fell in with, how long were you in the midst of uh, Lewin Davis? Not long, uh, I'd say 10 days. Oh really, just that yeah, quick? Yeah, all, all the car stuff was, the green, green screen um, on the car stuff is so good that first time I saw the film, I'd go, God damn, where did we shoot that? And it was all in a, 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 a warehouse, a garage in Yonkers. <clears throat> uh, just the uh, the technology has has uh, come along so far that it, it really looked real. So it's been 26 years of working with the Coens now. Uh, how, when, if, when can I quit? <laughs> have, how are they different now than like in in the raising Arizona days? Not that I can see. Um, they got more money to play with, but it was cool uh, in the raising Arizona days because there was no money and, and they wanted a shot, they'd just invent ways of doing it. Uh, like They'd strap a camera on a board and they have two guys run it um, to get a shot. Uh, whatever they needed, they invented. Uh, we were looking, there was a still up earlier uh, of you coming out of the blue muck, uh, coming up out yeah. of the, that, how did, were you in the muck? I yeah, mean, we, they, they dug a muck pit, uh, covered it with styrofoam and then covered that with more muck and, and something else. I don't, I don't want to know what kind of chemical it was. And, uh, you know, they'd have us pop our heads through that. <laughs> and, you know, I'd, I'd always fancied myself quite the actor that I got cast in this fabulous role. Uh, I must have been doing something right, but it, it turns out they just used me because I had a baby face. But <laughs> Bill Forsyth, the guy that played my brother in it, uh, we both had baby faces, so that's why they used us. <laughs> and I got these great, horrible prison sideburns that I grew, which were great for the movie, but when I went out to the bars at night and tried to meet people, it didn't work. <laughs> and they put so much crap in my hair that I couldn't get it out unless I used Dawn dishwashing liquid <laughs> for about a week straight. You know, You've had a lot of different careers, but one of the little sidebars while you're doing all these other talk shows and uh, Roseanne, all these other things has been uh, uh, animation. The, one of the more successful uh, voiceover artists that there are, and now it's been, I counted like uh, 20 different uh, films starting in, back in Frosty the Snowman in 1992. Uh, uh, going through all sorts of stuff uh, and Emperor's New Groove, uh, which was hugely successful, and then you hit the Monsters franchise, which has just had one out this year. What a year! Um, how does that differ? How, I, I mean, I it's, know the obvious part, but how does it differ? I started doing that because we had a, a baby in 1990 who turned out to be a Newman baby. I don't know if there's any Newman grads here. Um, and a cheap babysitter and attention getter was uh, cartoons. I love cartoons. So I, I, I'd go out and buy these classic uh, 
Warner Brothers cartoons, Bugs Bunny cartoons, and then they started releasing old old uh, Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck cartoons, and we just sit and watch cartoons all the time. And um, I did when they these uh, cartoons became available. I wanted to do them for her. <laughs> so she could hear my voice, and it didn't make a goddamn bit of difference. She'd hear it and go, yeah, okay. <laughs> When's dinner? <laughs> uh, but, I, yeah, that's when I started doing it for her. But the, the thing with animation is, at least for me, it it takes so much energy. You, I use my whole body um, to get whatever I need across vocally. And it, 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 it's exhausting. After a couple, three hours, I'm, I'm wiped out. Wow. How, then they, they run you that long? Three or four hours? Uh, yeah, they usually book four-hour sessions. Well, like uh, in the Monsters, you and Billy, did you work on the same set? or did no, that, you was, do it that was so Billy's idea. Uh, we started recording separately, which is how they do things traditionally. You come in, read your lines with somebody else, and then the, they'll fill in the other actor's voice later. Uh, and it was Billy's idea to put the two of us together, and when it did, the the energy just exploded. It, it uh, really increased, uh, and it was uh, why did we think of this in the first place? And then and then Billy would start improvising, and I'd just try to catch up with him, uh, and a lot of it made it into the film. You know, it's, it's amazing. A lot of people don't realize uh, how much the voiceover people put into the film because the audio comes first, and then they draw off of the audio. They draw the pictures off the audio. So when you do things like improvise and the like, a lot of that makes it into the movie. Yeah, and they'll have a, 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 a video camera in the booth so they can catch your facial expressions and, and, and your body movements, and they incorporate that a lot of times into the animation. I've noticed it made you a lot more real. That it, it, Some of the same gestures and things that I've seen, the smile and some of those things are just uh, amazingly into the, uh, in the character. Yeah, the, 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 the Pixar people especially are, are geniuses like that. Well, when did, uh, your daughter's name is Holly. When did Holly figure out it was you in the, uh, in, in the cartoons? It's Molly. And Molly, sorry. After I told her it was. Oh, Santa That's Claus. That's daddy. <laughs> I did that for you. <laughs> um, I know that after uh, Katrina, you came back here and invested in one of the shows that was investing in the city in Treme. Um, uh, what was it like to be in the show and what was it like to get killed off? <laughs> they, they told me from Jump Street, I, I was in New York doing a, um, a movie and Eric and David, the creators, Came, came to visit me and uh, it was a late, the character was a late addition to the show. Uh, they explained to me what they wanted to do was a character who was able through the internet to vent his frustrations at the Army Corps of Engineers, at the late response uh, to the crisis, to everything that was pissing him off about uh, what, what was wrong with uh, post-Katrina. And it gave me a voice uh, to vent my anger and apparently a lot of other people as well. Um, and then he walks off the ferry. And then they, they told me that was gonna happen anyway. But it was great to work at home. The last season, by the way, starts uh, this coming week on the first uh, and goes for five weeks. Uh, and the last show, the last uh, 20 minutes, are in the uh, St. Anne Parade on Mardi Gras, and there's 37 of these kids in the, on the, as extras on the set. Uh, Did so, y'all have fun? <laughs> no. No. It, oh, it was cold. It work. It was cold and nasty. Um, it, it, what, what I love most about Treme was the exposure that the local musicians got. A lot. Yeah. Uh, I, seeing that, that second show with Coco Roba show, and now it's about all we oh, have. Oh, man. Yeah. I know. It, that was a killer for me, too. Um, you stayed here, and you did In the Electric Mist with the, the, the French director, Bertrand Tarbinier. Uh, how was it working with a classical French director versus some of the other people you've worked with? We uh, uh, both found that we had jazz in common. He did a, a, a film that contained one of the best acting performances I'd ever seen. I mean, it is right in the top five. Um, Dexter Gordon, uh, the great tenor saxophonist, was so real. 
and it, it, it did not make a false move in that in that movie to the point where uh, Marlon Brando called him up uh, after he, Marlon saw the film and, and just you know how do I do that? <laughs> um, it, it just praised him to high heaven. Um, and I, I knew I, wa I wanted to work with him. Uh, and when we talked about jazz a lot, the big, big jazz fan. And we got to work in New Iberia. I've yeah. never been down there. Um, so on days off, I'd drive around and uh, explore southwest Louisiana. What a great trip. Yeah. And that was, uh, that was kind of the beginning of what's become like your, your incredible golden years that are going on now. Uh, uh, in uh, in 2011, you My were retirement years. No, last thing that he's doing. 2011, you were in two different Oscar-nominated films. Uh, you were in Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close, and in The Artist, a silent black and white film. What was that? What was that? It was like? a silent black and white, white film. film. <laughs> How yeah, I, I, I've been sitting around for a while. I was afraid the, the phone stopped ringing. And I, I didn't think I was going to get much work. I was trying to, oh, maybe I could do a stage project about Hemingway, just forcing anything. I was, I was getting desperate. That's pretty goddamn desperate. <laughs> and then um, uh, Kevin Smith called uh, to do a film called uh, Red State which uh, then he bought and released it straight to DVD. I, I don't know why, but I, I thought it was a good movie and I was hoping it would do well. But, um, and then right after that, I did The Artist. Uh, they, the Frenchman, Michel, came in and, and met me in my agent's office. And we talked about films and we talked about old Hollywood. And he sold me, and I, I just wanted to be a part of it. And then I got to meet uh, the fabulous Jean Dujardin, who did not, at the time, speak a word of English. He does now very well, because uh, I'll never speak French. I just, I'm a idiot. <laughs> I just don't have that part of my brain, or a voice. Um, was it different on the set? It was, yeah, because we had to improvise. Oh, really? Yeah, everything was improvised. And um, he would improvise in French, and I would listen and improvise back in English. And somehow it worked. That totally. Well, that was really, uh, that film, it was, it was spectacular. It was great because it was the first, uh, we don't, it was the first shot, film I shot in Hollywood in years. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, nobody works in Hollywood anymore. Everything is out now uh, uh, on location. Um, I think they have a problem with their... Uh, it's more expensive to shoot in Los Angeles now, which is it's kind of a shame because they got such great weather and all the equipment's there. But, I mean, I'm, I'm happy for New Orleans. It, it's, it's great to see the film industry here. Uh, but... It was so charming. We shot at a studio that was built, I think, in 1913 on Cahuenga Boulevard. And, and uh, they used all these great old locations in Hollywood. And it, it was just magical to shoot in Hollywood. What fun. Yeah. And then you went into 2002 and three absolute killers, the first of which was Argo, which uh, made such a gigantic. Uh, yeah, I got Argo because of Red State. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, ben Affleck is, is really good pals with Kevin Smith, and I, I'm pretty sure that's how I got Argo. And I got to shoot with the beautiful Alan Arkin. What fun. Yeah. And then came uh, another of your characters that'll never go away, the dealer in flight with uh, Denzel. Uh, what a great character. How did you wire yourself up <laughs> for that guy? Uh, sense memory. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he had a lot of energy. Uh, went in and took over the set. I liked uh, how you took over the uh, three Secret Service agents or FBI agents in a room when uh, uh, oh, a yeah. great scene when you came in to bring Denzel his, his dose of coke to get him ready to go to, uh, to court. It was uh, really spectacular. <laughs> well, the guy was on a mission. 
he felt important. He had his tools with him. And he knew how to use them. <laughs> Certainly. And then you fall into Hangover 3. Now, <laughs> what happened there? Uh, that must have been a fun project with that bunch of loons. It was. We, we had a wonderful time. Um, I had to work with uh, Ken Jeong, who, was, who did his medical. He's a doctor. And he did his medical residency here at, uh, in New Orleans at Tulane. I remember hearing that. And he was still being a doctor when he got his first little uh, break to become uh, a character. A yeah, character. He, he wanted to do a comedy, and uh, his medical advisor or doctor or head, head guy, whatever they call him, uh, thought it would help him in his practice. So he, he, he led him out to do uh, comedy nights. Wow. And then we've come to this year, which... Um, has been spectacular. First, Lewin, of course, this great film that you guys just saw. Uh, but uh, you've just come from, a, and I know everybody asked you about it, you've just come from being in New York for this entirely new creature, Alpha House, which you're the star of. Uh, that is a, a and I, I heard a great quote from you saying you didn't care about delivery, you just cared about the acting, uh, that is coming out on Amazon. Yeah, yeah Amazon dot com uh, something something I I just it was it, it was just so much like shooting a normal television show that I really didn't uh, bother myself with the details of how it's going to be seen as long as the checks cleared who cares <laughs> <laughs> and um, it it was interesting because we shot the pilot in February. Right, be right before I left to do Monuments Men. Um, and when they put the pilot to together, they had other pilots that they showed on Amazon.com and then they had people vote on them, uh, which I, I, I doubt if it's ever been done before. <laughs> uh, and, but it, it's certainly an interesting way to do things. It, it shows you that uh, you know how, how how your response is going to be almost immediately. Well, and and Alpha House, there were like thirty something pilots put up. Alpha House got th by far the most votes uh, to be put on the air. So uh, obviously, you did Vote something for right. Pedro. <laughs> Yeah, we and we didn't campaign or anything. <laughs> yeah. Not like running for homecoming queen, which I lost by that much. <laughs> when when we first communicated, uh, well, for Pedro. <laughs> last spring, you were in Berlin for a long while doing monuments, Ben, uh, with what seemed like the dream cast of the universe. It's the most fun I've ever had doing a film. Uh, George Clooney wrote, produced, and direct, directed it. Um, Bob Balaban, Matt Damon, Bill Murray, um, Kate Blanchett. Oh God, I'm missing somebody here. But it was so loose. It was so loose because George knew exactly what he wanted. Um, and didn't waste any time doing it. We we do one or two takes. He goes, okay, that's it. Let's move on. Um, but because he's so prepared, because he knew what he wanted, because he was so decisive, we could um, we could have time to goof around. And boy, did we ever! Uh, but uh, yeah, I never had a better time doing a film. It's what a year! What a year! You know, I. I we were going to go ahead and just go straight on through, but I think uh, I think it'd be really fun, even though I know, guys, we'd said we weren't going to do a Q&A, to let you guys ask questions. Uh, uh, let's just open it up. You're going to have to yell a little loud to get it up to them, but does anybody have any questions? How about you right here? Hi, thanks for coming. Um, so one question I have. Early on in your career, I know it's very, sorry, my voice is losing as well. <laughs> um, early on in the career, I know it's hard sometimes to really get started and like get yourself into the scene. So what was like something you would tell yourself to like, you know, keep going to keep yourself moving? I, uh, part of it was uh, I had seen other people uh, at auditions and perform that uh, 
and this is practical, it, it, it's not an ego thing, but I, I seriously knew that I was better then. And I, th I thought, well, just, you know, don't quit, just be persistent, because one way or another you can, you can do this. Um, and, and just being stubborn, uh, but, but also to, uh, being as realistic as I could. Um, Yeah, yeah. Try, you know, trying to keep my feet on the ground, be real, um, and being stubborn. Nope. Another question there. They're leaving in droves. <laughs> Hi. Um, I've always is wanted there's to. There's no fire or anything, is there? Not yet. <laughs> um, I've always wanted to meet you, by the way, and so this is really a pleasure. Um, and I'm a musician by trade, but I was wondering, I got really burnt out with music, relying on it as a form of income. So I'm wondering how you keep your passion, because it is something you rely on as well for your living. How I keep my passion, it, um, I, I did have trouble with it for a long time. It, it, it came and went. Um, and that's mostly through me being a screw up and losing sight of how grateful I should be. And gratitude has a lot to do with it. Um, because with all the other crap, I forget that not everybody in the world gets to do what, what they love for a living. And um, for whatever reason, I've been extremely lucky and I know how lucky I've been and, and I am very grateful for that, and I'm very grateful for the people that I've met and gotten to work with. Uh, and I would say that that, more than anything else, um, connects me with the passion. Another question? Yeah, hi. Um, I'm gonna do a casting for a movie. Um, what, do you, what advice would you have? Like, would you stick to what they give you, or would you do something else? Like, would you? make the casting video different in some way? Like oh, how, how would you you're stand talking out? about a performer? Yeah. Oh, you, cause you said casting. I thought maybe you were a casting agent. No, no, for a movie, like make, put, You have to be yourself. Uh, they're gonna see so many other people. You, uh, you know, early on, I'd, I'd try to do the Brando slouch. <laughs> uh, uh, it just basically, try to be what I thought was interesting. Uh, find an angle on the character that only you can bring to it. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah just uh, yeah, be yourself and commit to it. Commit to being yourself, commit to the, uh, that role. And uh, do as many auditions as you can. I, I know that sounds silly, but uh, the more you get, the more inured you are to rejection. Um, it, yeah, it's important to, to try to grow a tough skin. But yeah, uh, man, it sounds so cornball, but be yourself. I heard that a million times. It went in one ear and out the other every time until something happened and I said, oh yeah, this makes sense. Great, there's another right over here. There you go. Hi, um, I was gonna ask about, you talked about starting off as a stage actor and transitioning to screen. Sorry, start, starting off? Yeah, when you started out, you said you started on stage and you fell in love with acting on stage, but then you transitioned to being on screen. And I was wondering, um, that transition from stage to screen, if it was difficult for you, or if you could give any pointers to stage actors on how to make the jump from stage to I, screen. I still consider myself a stage actor. It's, uh, it's been five years since I've been on a stage, but uh, it's just a matter of style and uh, reacting to the person you're doing a scene with. and responding to the, uh, the direction you're given. It's just, it's a, yeah, it's, a, it's like a no-brainer. You just do it. Not the question. Is that, is that too glib? No, I, it, it's just, you know, if you, it's like having a conversation with somebody. 
Any other questions? Okay. Working on this, oh, how was it working on the set of Revenge of the Nerds? <laughs> we had a ball. <laughs> a lot of extra curricular stuff. Um, we're shooting at the University of Arizona, and you know, school was going on. Uh, there were a lot of great guys in the cast. Uh, some goofballs, but mostly just had fun. I re yeah, I remember uh, improvising a lot on that one because I couldn't remember my lines a lot of times. <laughs> <laughs> that had to do with extracurricular activities. <laughs> but yeah, you know, we, it was pretty loose and, and a lot of fun. And I'm, I'm surprised a lot of still people still remember that movie. <laughs> Ma'am? I, I just, could you say a few quick words about damages? Um, Your character? Like three quick words or? <laughs> I don't know that anybody ever saw it. <laughs> That's what I was looking for. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, we got to shoot it in New York at Steiner Studios, and I was like working in New York. Um, the scripts were good. I got to play, I, that's one of the first times I, I, I hated the character I was playing. I couldn't find, a, you, you always try to find something in common. I just hated the guy. And that, that made it a little harder. Um, but it seems like I always try to make things as hard on myself as I possibly can. Um, yeah, that's the thing I remember. I love working with uh, Glenn Close. Um, yeah, I just did not like the guy. But I love the crew. Yeah, I love the people I was working with. I just didn't like the guy. Another question over here. Hello, Mr. Goodman. Um, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that you didn't like your character because my question is um, how if you've ever worked with another actor that you couldn't stand, how did you make good art? By pretending to be the character that I was supposed to be. Okay. And I don't know that I'd call it art. Uh, yeah. That's it's going to happen. And I. Oh God! I and you know, I'm sure it's come down the pipe. Uh, I've never really out and out hated somebody. I've been in uncomfortable situations. Uh, you just have to focus harder. And, and, you know, really concentrate on the scene, what your character is supposed to be doing. And just try to get out of your own head for a minute, which is usually a good thing anyway. Um, yeah, it, it helps you to lose yourself. Somebody at the back of the house? Oh, yeah? <laughs> I couldn't understand you, sir. I'm sorry. Here you go. There, the mic's getting to him. There he goes. Okay. Um, what about being an actor and uh, making a career out of playing other people's uh, roles, essentially. I mean, if you're an actor, that means you play everyone else's role. So what about that does it for you? What about that really uh, stimulates you to make a full career out of being an actor? I, 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 I mean, that is the definition of an actor. <laughs> uh, you don't necessarily concentrate on that or think about it. It's, uh, or you just do what's in front of you at the time. I, yeah, I'm afraid, I'm not trying to be glib, I just don't know how to answer the question. You get one other question Sorry. over here? Just a second, the mic is coming to him, here we go. They can't all be winners, son. <laughs> Sorry. One last question here. Uh, what is one book that you're either reading now or have read that you could recommend to uh, the people in the hall here? Uh, Catcher in the Rock. Uh, <laughs> I always go back to it. 
Oh, God. Uh, I'm a big Hemingway freak. Um, God, there's so many books. A book about acting? John, is one last, one last sort of uh, uh, coda to this, since, again, there's so many people. Hot <laughs> no, I'm trying to think of the name of the book. Oh, the book the, still. A, a, a very important acting book. An uh, acting book. By Boleslavsky. Uh, it's, it's a book by Boleslavsky, and I can't, the name escapes me right now. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> We'll get it to him on the email. Yeah, there's also a good one by Michael Chekhov. Well, most of these people uh, that Damn. are here from Loyola, you get this, are, uh, again, they're getting ready. Uh, a lot of them are seniors. And in the spring, they're getting ready to pop out into the world. Uh, a lot of them uh, <laughs> artists of various sorts, musicians, actors, uh, visual artists. Uh, any kind of advice on, on dealing with the real world? You went out at 23 and just went to New York. What do you think, what's, what sort of advice could you give these kids getting out there? Just, yeah, try to stay true to yourself. Uh, have fun, relax. I, oh man, this is gonna go in one ear and out the other. <laughs> um, try to remember why you're doing it in the first place. Um, don't feel too badly if you have to make little compromises along the way. It's part of life and it will make you a stronger person. But don't go, by the same token, you know, don't go nuts and sell out, sell your soul. But if you do, get a good price for it. <laughs> I recommend going on eBay. Um, yeah, it's the same old jive I've, I've heard forever, but try, stay, stay true to yourselves. And um, don't hurt anybody. Ladies and gentlemen, John Goodman. Uh